Okay, welcome to Scottish Literature's Unexplored Archives, which is the first in a series of events hosted by the International Association for the Study of Scottish Literatures. It's lovely to see you all, um, many familiar names and new names, um, or at least to see the little black boxes that represent you. Uh, let me just start by saying, um, could you please keep your microphones off so that we don't get any feedback uh, when the speakers are speaking? Um, we are recording the session, so if you, uh, it will be focusing on the speakers during the recording, but if you would prefer to um, keep yourself invisible, that's, that's absolutely fine. Uh, there'll be time for questions after the presentations, but if questions occur during the talks, um, please feel free to post them in the chat and I'll try and keep track of them. Um, I'm going to hand things over to Carla just for a few brief words before we, we begin this, the uh, panel presentations. Indeed, yes, I'm going to very brief. Thank you, Juliet. It is my great pleasure today to welcome all of you to the first of a series of online events, dialogues, um, designed by IASLA, the International Association for the Study of Scottish Literatures, um, and aimed at uh, creating a virtual space for encounter, conversation, and inspiration for all scholars and fans of Scottish literature across the globe. So much has the interest in this field of studies developed and expanded in the past couple of decades. Um, over a year has now gone by since the pandemic shattered doors to in-person conferences. Uh, online lectures and events are by now part of our daily life. And while we all certainly look forward to a return to things as before, it seems clear that virtuality will remain an essential tool for academic exchange in the decades to come. So Dialogues was not simply designed to replace the conferences we are missing, uh, to make a virtue of necessity, so to speak, uh, but rather to explore new ways of supporting Scottish studies through collaboration, engagement, and exchange, as stated um, in our mission. Um, and this is, of course, also an opportunity to invite those of you who are not IASLA members yet to join our community. Um, and to make your voice heard and your opinions known. And you will find all the relevant information on our website. I do not wish to take away further time from the event, but let me just thank all of you for joining us today. Um, and a special thanks, of course, to today's very distinguished speakers for accepting our invitation and to Juliet for setting up and coordinating such a remarkable dialogic encounter. So without um, further ado, I will give uh, the floor to Juliet. Thank you. Sorry, first gaff of, uh, <laughs> of the event. Um, I've unmuted. So this panel was inspired by longing and frustration on my part. Um, I haven't been in a library for over a year, uh, let alone had access to archival material. And I'm sure that many of you are in the same position. Um, as in other aspects of life, the pandemic has revealed inequities, making me more cognizant of the privileges underlying archival research at any time who has the money to travel to archives and the time to devote to exploring them. Historically, those with time and money have determined which archives are celebrated publicly and which languish in dusty cupboards because they've been deemed uninteresting or irrelevant or possibly haven't even been recognized as an archive. Archives are in the eye of the beholder after all. The examination of unexplored or unrecognized archives has the potential to open new lines of inquiry in Scottish literary studies. Our panelists today, who are at various stages in the research process and in their careers, will share the challenges and rewards of working with their particular archive and suggest the new lines of inquiry their research might open up. While it doesn't solve problems of equitable accessibility to the archives themselves, the panel will share the exciting findings that these speakers are working on 
and allow us to vicariously enjoy some archival research through them. Um, I'm going to introduce each speaker uh, before they, they talk as, as we go along. So our first speaker is Leif Davis, professor at Simon Fraser University. Uh, you'll know her as the author of Acts of Union and Music, Postcolonialism and Gender, and is editor of several volumes on 18th century and Romantic era Scottish literature. Her latest book, Mediating Cultural Memory in Britain and Ireland from the 1688 Revolution to the 1745 Jacobite Rebellion, which is forthcoming on Cambridge University of Press, examines media change and cultural memory in the British archipelago during the early 18th century. Leith is also director of the Centre for Scottish Studies at Simon Fraser University, which is holding an event tomorrow on decolonizing Scottish studies for which you can still register. So I am going to post the link for that in the chat and um, hand over to Leith now. Thanks. Okay, thanks so much, Juliet and Carla for organizing this and inviting me to participate in it. Um, I'm just going to share my screen and um, hopefully this will work and you'll be able to see my slides. Is that working? Thumbs up? Yes, great. Okay. Um, so I am on a different location than usual. I'm actually at work uh, because we had a power outage this morning. So I hastily ran up here and I'm here after not being here for a year. So uh, just trying to get my bearings here. Um, so I'm I'm embarking on a, a project that's called Networking Jac Jacobites, the Lion in Mourning Manuscript of Robert Forbes. Um, and this is a, a, a fellowship that I'll be taking up at um, the Institute for Advanced Studies in Humanities at Edinburgh University. And it's also uh, funded by SHRC, uh, the, the Social Science and Humanities Research Center um, of Canada. So I want to thank them for their um, generous support of the project. And it was supposed to be an in-person fellowship. So I was supposed to be actually working in archives um, in Edinburgh and meeting people and networking. Um, it's going to be remote, so I'm doing some adjustments. Um, and it, the project focuses on this manuscript, which may or may not be familiar to people. It's the Lion in Mourning. Um, it's uh, currently held in the National Library of Scotland. The objectives of the project are fourfold. Uh, first, to generate new public and academic awareness and understanding of this key text of British history and the individual co and collective voices that it represents, and um, to also shed new light on Jacobite networks in the British Isles. It also brings to um, book history and cultural memory studies an archipelagic perspective. And I also consider it um, attempting a model of new kinds of research, networking research, more collaborative, um, more decolonized research. So there are three parts to the project. The first is simply the digitization of the manuscript, um, making it more available to more people. Um, there's a qualitative and a quantitative analysis of the manuscript, and there's also the creation of an online contextual resource with interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary perspectives, and I'm calling on my colleagues to help me uh, with that part. There is a networking Jacobites network, and I want to give a big shout out to Ralph McLean at the National Library of Scotland for all his help. Um, also to the Digital Humanities Innovation Lab, who are helping and will be helping more with this project, and a wonderful student team of researchers, Taylor, Jasmine, Alyssa, and Caitlin McInnes as well, um, and colleagues who will be joining um, the project as we go along. Those of you who aren't familiar with this manuscript, I want to give you just a bit of background about it. So the, the writer, compiler Forbes, was an Episcopalian clergyman. He was arrested during the 1745 Jacobite Rising. Um, and he was held in Stirling Castle first, and then in Edinburgh Castle. And he was released 
uh, in May 1746. He took up residence in Leith at that point, and he began to compile speeches, letters, poems, eyewitness accounts, all the information that he could, as well as conduct interviews, in-person interviews. It was a process of information gathering. He utilized organizational strategies that would be familiar to us from print culture. So pages, title pages, page numbers, footnotes, et cetera, et cetera. And he compiled 10 volumes between 1747 and his death in 1775, um, uh, most in the first five years. So in terms of the qualitative analysis, I'm looking at this as a work of cultural memory. Uh, Forbes himself says, I have a great anxiety to make the collection as complete and exact as possible for the instruction of future ages in a piece of history the most remarkable and interesting that ever happened in any age or country. These are moving stories that have been really dismissed often as Jacobite propaganda with uh, with notable exceptions. Um, and I've explored this a bit in my forthcoming book. Also, I wanted to just draw people's attention to the film that Murray Pittock um, is, is involved in and that he posted uh, recently, The Last Battle, which features Robert Forbes and The Line of Mourning. Now, in this, this um, line of morning manuscript, we can see these complex forms of media and temporal memory. I think of these as what Michael Rothberg calls knots of cultural memory. So not so much sites as knots, rhizomatic networks of temporality and cultural reference that exceed attempts at territorialization and identitarian reduction. Let me give you some examples so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, Forbes himself got his material from multimedia sources, uh, including uh, oral testimony, works of manuscript like letters, but he also copied out works that were circulating in print at the time. Material that Forbes copied out also circulated in other formats. Um, Alexis, which is a novel about uh, Charles Edward Stewart, uh, which Forbes actually included in his manuscript compilation. Um, Ascanius, which is another uh, kind of no novella about the, uh, the escape of Charles Edward Stewart. Uh, so these are circulating at the time. We also find the material, however, in very strange places like Defoe's tour of the whole island of Great Britain. And indeed, we see that material from the tour also finds its way into material that Forbes copies out in the line and morning as well. So there's this, this medial uh, network happening. In terms of the entangled temporalities, we have many different kinds of temporality that, rep that are represented. So Forbes himself is narrating the past. He's also at the moment that he's writing, writing and creating a present to bring together a network. But this is complicated. The past in certain instances and examples in the work is a future for the writer. So we have writers like Robert Lyons who wrote his letter to be read after his execution, kind of anticipating the future. And at the same time, Forbes himself is creating these new networks, reading out the material to people and indicating uh, in the book itself that he's reading out material and has read out material. So he's kind of knitting it together in temporally complicated and entangled ways. As he says, I began to read such part of Glenna Allidale's journal as I knew Patrick Grant to be interested in, he having been an eyewitness of what was narrated therein. So this is a kind of palimpsestic time entanglement in terms of cultural memory. Now, hopefully using DH Digital Humanities tools, Palladio, T encoding, ArcGIS, we'll be able to analyze and visualize these kinds of rhizomatic connections. And I just wanna refer here to Ruth Annert's work, 
um, where she suggests that digital humanities makes it possible with relative ease and speed to measure the relationships between many entities in multiple ways, allowing a rich multidimensional reading of complex systems never possible before. Annard also suggests that this network analysis we can do with digital humanities provides us with maneuvers that refigure cultural objects in our minds as abstract systems of nodes and edges, mechanical maneuvers that structure data and navigate input versus output, and maneuvers between a landscape of abstraction and research questions that are steeped in contextual information. And this is exactly what I'm trying to do with this project. Um, and we should also think of Robert Forbes in his own time really creating a kind of information network um, using the tools that he did. Now, The Light and Morning was not published as, as a whole in Forbes's lifetime. Um, it has an interesting afterlife. Um, it was published in Robert Chambers' Jacobite Memoirs of the, of the Rebellion of 1745. And it was also published as a, as a whole in a printed version in 1895 to six, edited by Henry Payton. And it's this edition which is available on the National Library of Scotland site. What's been this result, I suggest, is that the line in mourning has become an occluded manuscript. People know about it, but they don't actually see it and see the embodied uh, uh, manuscript itself. So scholars of Jacobitism know about the manuscript, but, the, but with important exceptions, Murray Piddick, Vicki Coltman, for example, they quote um, Patton, Peyton's edition instead. It's occluded the original manuscript. So my project is really designed to use digital imaging, imaging techniques to refocus our attention on the affordances of the original manuscript, which is very different from the printed version. This will remind us as well that the manuscript itself is a relic of material memory. Um, indeed, it, 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 it included these relics such as fabric from Charles Edward Stewart's gown when he's disguised as Betty Burke. It's built into um, the cover of the book. And we have to think of this manuscript itself um, as a site of memory, entangled memory, as Forbes's hand repurposes and reanimates the words as he's writing, combining personal and collective embodied memory. So hopefully the project will be able to focus and make this text available, contextualize it, as well as expand the network of people interested in Jacobite studies um, beyond the usual suspects to include trauma studies, tourism, art history, book history, etc. Um, I was just going to conclude then by encouraging people, if you want to find out more about the project, please do follow, um, follow me on Twitter or get in contact with me if you'd like to uh, join the project. Also, this is collaborative research, so very happy to have different perspectives involved, especially early career researchers and students, I should say. All right, thank you very much and um, looking forward to the following presentations. I'll just stop sharing and mute. Thank you so much, Leith. That was uh, wonderful. I, I can't believe you wrote 10 whole volumes. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's a lot of, of writing, a, a lot to explore. Um, could you post the uh, link to the project in the chat when you get a chance? Thanks. Our next speaker is Matthew Lee, who is a PhD candidate at the University of Aberdeen, where he's working on a thesis titled Private Reflections and Public Pronouncements, Caribbean Slavery in the Scottish Consciousness from 1750 to 1834. He's organizing a conference on colonial co connections and Northeast Scotland to be held on the 17th and 18th of June. And I'm going to post a link to that in the chat as well, um, so you can find out more about that and register for it if you feel so inclined. Uh, thanks very much, Matthew. I will pass over to you now. Okay, thanks for that introduction. I'm just going to share my screen and hopefully this works. The magic bit. <laughs> <laughs> 
Right. Um, can everybody hear me, see me, see my screen as well? Excellent. Great. Um, well, thank you for coming along to the event today, and thank you to, to Juliet and other organisers for hosting it. Today, I want to talk about my experiences of researching Scottish literature that discusses the Atlantic slave trade and chattel slavery in the Caribbean, um, and also some Scottish literary figures who have direct and personal connections uh, to slavery in the Caribbean as well. So just to be a bit of context about my project, and my PhD is a collaboration between the University of Aberdeen and the National Library of Scotland. Um, so I'm just going to call it the library from now on with a capital L. So I apologise to anybody else from any other libraries. You've been relegated to a library with a small L. Uh, the project was devised because library staff were aware that the library had become, um, almost in an unintended way, a repository of documents that chart Scotland's historic connections to slavery in the Atlantic world. So part of my role, part of my project, is to unearth research and write about some of the material that's been underused previously, with a particular focus on the literary aspects of Scotland's engagement with slavery. Another aspect of the project has been actual hands-on work in the library. So towards the tail end of 2019, I was involved in a three-month project to catalogue some of the library's manuscripts that touch on slavery. And as of next week, um, from the comfort of my bedroom, I will be working on the next project, which is going to be to overhaul the library's slavery website, which I hope will make some of this material a bit more accessible in future. Um, so kind of watch this space on that. So during the rest of the talk, I just want to give a, a kind of brief overview of what actually constitutes the library slavery collections, a slavery archive, uh, consider the type of stories that researchers can tell using this archive, and then discuss some of the kind of underlying problems, gaps, silences in slavery archives uh, in the library and generally. So I'll just move on to my next slide. Um, so what kind of materials actually make up the library slavery archive? The, the image that you can see on the screen right now uh, doesn't look like it's got anything to do with slavery. Uh, it's actually the inside cover of a journal that was written um, about 200 years ago. So we can see there's just some pictures pasted in, some handwritten scrolls. Uh, however, it, it's actually the journal of a, a chap called Alexander Innes of Lonehead, who was an army officer from Bamshire, uh, and he travelled to Jamaica uh, in 1823, arrived in Kingston in December 1823. And between then and February 1824, Innes worked on, on various plantations and visited them for social reasons as well. Uh, so if you kind of flick past this kind of uh, innocuous inside cover, you get a detailed, vivid, and often very violent account of everyday life in a Caribbean slave society. So in many ways, this journal reflects a more general rule about the slavery-related material that's actually held in the library. Its slavery archive hasn't been assembled because of some deliberate collections management policy, at least not kind of pre, you know, previously. Rather, it's kind of been pieced together because it collects 18th and 19th century material about Scottish history anyway, and by dint of creating this material and Scotland's connections to the Caribbean, these sources have kind of been compiled and we've got this slavery archive without kind of needing to have one. So if we just kind of move on uh, to some of the other things that are in the, the library's um, slavery collection just quickly. On this slide, you'll see a letter uh, written in 1834. It was sent from Jamaica by a woman called Eleanor Affleck to her daughter Sarah in Edinburgh, and it discusses um, impending emancipation and it's a useful reminder that Scottish women were involved in slavery and enslaved other people, uh, and an important reminder that women in the Caribbean weren't kind of historically marginal figures. The next slide we see here uh, are the names and assigned values of enslaved people uh, at Huntley Estate in Demerara, present-day British Guyana. Uh, these people were the legal property of a chap called Robert Gordon, and they were sold at auction when he died, and that's why we see the price that uh, was attached to them. Similarly, on this slide, um, we couldn't actually get the whole document into a single picture. It's a kind of huge vellum contract, um, but it shows the deed of sale of Higher Plantation in Tobago in 1774, uh, and it includes the names of the enslaved people included in the sale in a kind of appendix to the document. Uh, so this slide and the one before shows the ways that kind of Scots were uh, actively involved in commodifying other human beings in the Caribbean. The next couple of slides uh, are slightly obscured again, just because I can't, my, my photography is so dodgy um, and PowerPoint wouldn't play ball, but it's examples of printed material that are in the library's collections uh, that discuss slavery. So the first here 
is from the, the virulently pro-slavery Glasgow Courier, edited by James McQueen of uh, Blackwood's fame. And the second is an eyewitness um, account written by um, Thomas Smith, who published in our broth uh, about his journey in the Middle Passage. Uh, and each of these examples shows that literature and print culture uh, were central to the dissemination of ideas about slavery and the, the political debates that attended uh, issues with slavery in Scotland. So what kind of stories can we tell um, using these archival materials? So based on the, the cataloging that I did, I've drawn up a, a few kind of very basic maps that show the, the place names mentioned in the manuscripts. So here on the first slide, we see um, the, the kind of uh, dispersal or the kind of uh, placement of Scots across the Atlantic world, so Scotland itself, a couple of examples in West Africa across to the Americas. We can uh, zoom in a little bit more. We'll see a sort of deep concentration of Scots in the Caribbean, uh, also on the, the North American continent as well, but going from sort of Jamaica in the west all the way south and east down into Guyana itself. And then if we look at the, the place names that are mentioned, uh, Scottish place names mentioned, we can see that all the way from Campbelltown in southwest Scotland up to Turriff in northeast Scotland, north of where I am in Aberdeenshire, Scots were involved in the slave trade. So we can see that this connection was a, a genuinely national one. Um, and I'll actually touch on an example from Shetland later. Um, so you see not even mainland Scotland um, it isn't the kind of true territorial extent of the connections. So kind of touching on specific literary figures now, uh, the picture that we've got here is a, a copy of Hector McNeil's unpublished manuscript memoir dated 1804. And the memoir confirms that McNeil had a, a relative who was involved in the slave trade in Bristol. And in fact, this relative tried to get him to go on slave trading voyages, but for various reasons changed his mind and instead sent him to live with the sort of second cousins in the West Indies. Uh, the memoir recounts that this particular stint in the West Indies, one of three that McNeil undertook uh, throughout his life, uh, during which time he visited a number of islands, both French uh, and uh, British colonies. Uh, uh, for example, the journal contains details of a, a quite brutal assault on an enslaved man, a kind of freedom-seeking man, someone who'd run away from a plantation that McNeil witnessed uh, in Grenada. And much of the contents of this mem manuscript memoir are also found in McNeil's fictionalised memoir, a printed uh, copy, if you like, uh, a, a published uh, volume, I should say, Memoirs of the Life and Travels of Charles McPherson, which was published in 1800, a copy of which is also available in the library. And it's not completely clear which came first, though it is interesting that the scene um, kind of capturing this assault that's in the manuscript memoir doesn't appear in the published account in Charles McPherson, so that suggests to me that these more kind of candid observations contained in unpublished work point to the usefulness of incorporating archival research into the kind of method, methodology of studying literature. Um, another example of how, I'll just move on to the next slide, uh, another example of how archival work can enrich the study of literature is the life and writing of Tobias Smollett. Um, so one of the kind of crucial episodes in Smollett's The Adventures of Roderick Random, another deeply kind of autobiographical work revolves around Roderick's involvement in the slave trade. In fact, this is the sort of pivotal moment in, in the plot. And the, the description of the voyage in the text itself, in which 400 people are captured by Roderick and his crew, transported to Buenos Aires and enslaved, is passed off in a kind of couple of paragraphs. Um, but the library slavery archive, unfortunately I don't have a picture of it, um, shows that Small was an, act, an active participant in the slave trade uh, a copy of a letter from Robert Cunningham Graham of Gart Moore, who was a, an enslaver, a, politi a radical politician, in fact, in Scotland, um, dated 8th of October 1768, confirms the sale of enslaved people that belonged to Smollett via his wife. Uh, we know that Smollett's in-laws were enslavers in Jamaica. We know that Smollett spent time there. Uh, and this letter is kind of conclusive evidence, amongst others, uh, that Smollett had a kind of knowing role in the slave trade. Uh, there's also a gap in Smollett's biography between 1741 and 1744, which is the precise period when he was in Jamaica. And this gap has led Smollett scholars like James Basker to speculate that he might have been involved in slave trade voyages along similar lines to his kind of fictional alter ego, Roderick Random. But unfortunately, we don't have definitive proof of this. However, what we can see on the screen now uh, are letters sent from Richard Holden of Baldove, which is near Dundee, who was a surgeon in slave trading uh, voyages and vessels that set sail from Bristol. 
and he wrote back a, a series of letters to his family in Scotland in the 1740s and 1750s that detail how he and his, his crewmates purchased, transported, and then enslaved uh, enslaved people in the Americas, specifically the Upper James River in Virginia and in Jamaica. Uh, the letters might be a way of offering some informed speculation of the type of things that Smollett might have got up to if indeed he had been part of these slave trading voyages. So once again, we can see that archival work can enrich readings of imaginative fiction that deal with the slave trade. And indeed these letters with their kind of anecdotes about far off places, interesting topics, ex exoticized uh, places, other places can be considered a form of literature in their own right. So those are the type of stories that we can tell. Unfortunately though, there's lots of stories that we can't. Uh, and that's to do with the skewed nature of the evidence that's available to researchers of the slave trade and slavery and serves as an important reminder of the power structures that undergird the formation of archives. So the material available at the library is written from a specific point of view, the point of view of the enslaver, and is not a kind of simple objective reflection of historical reality. So that's kind of one of the basic conceptual methodological challenges of this type of research is that there's not much trace left behind directly by enslaved people. So attempts to kind of piece together what their lives are like are kind of hampered by the nature of the evidence that we've got. So Vincent Brown, who's an eminent historian of slavery in the Caribbean, has suggested that when scholars, in his words, shift their emphasis from historical recovery to rigorous and responsible creativity, we recognize that archives are not just the, uh, the records bequeathed to us by the past. Archives also consist of the tools we use to explore it, the vision that allows us to read its sign and the design decisions that communicate our sense of history's possibilities. Wow. I think that's a very eye-opening, very lyrical piece of writing. <coughs> Excuse me. My interpretation of Brown's idea is it is okay to ask these kind of what if questions and to offer informed speculation as long as it's rooted in an informed, uh, grounded uh, understanding of the past. So to kind of finish off, uh, I'll talk about one example where the library's slavery collections can tell part of a story, but where gaps and silences remain. And I'm just going to take a swig of water before we go any further. So um, we can see here uh, on the screen uh, a letter about a dead man, uh, James and his senior, who was a Shetlander who ended up in Jamaica. And he died on that island in April 1798. And his death sparked a whole series of, of letter writing, um, basically by friends uh, in Jamaica to uh, kin back in Shetland. So thanks to his death, we actually have a, a fairly detailed view of what, and more precisely whom he owned in Jamaica. An inventory of Ennis's property includes uh, 36 enslaved people valued at a total of 3,110 pounds. Uh, and as a result of Innes' death, uh, these people were advertised for sale in Jamaica's newspapers. Amongst the enslaved people that Innes left behind was his own son, James Innes Jr. So James Jr. is an example of an enslaved person about whom we know quite a lot, but never from his own perspective. So we never get to hear James Jr. speak, as it were. We never really get to glimpse inside his head, never get to understand things from his perspective. Although we know his story, James Jr. isn't the one who told it. So in his senior's friend, Archibald Anderson, uh, who wrote the letter that's on the screen, wrote back to Shetland to advise of Ennis's death and the existence of this son. Uh, and in a further letter, um, not the one that's on the screen, but a different one, Anderson implies strongly that Ennis Jr. was enslaved. He reported that, quote, Mr. Ennis's reputed son, James, is well and lives with his mother on Anchovy Valley Estate. I expect his freedom would have been got this year and he sent home for education but his father's property not being sold has put a stop to that for present. In other words, James Ennis Jr.'s freedom was going to be paid for through the proceeds of the sale of other enslaved people owned by his father. And in July 1803, Anderson wrote to Lerwick that young Ennis was on his way to Glasgow before travelling on to Shetland. So James was actually only given two days notice that he was going to embark on a ship to take him halfway across the world home in inverted commas, to a place that he'd never seen or been before, as far as we know. A bill of exchange was sent to Shetland in order to defray the expenses of James's uh, voyage. And the source of that money was, quote, part payment of the Negroes, 
that had belonged to his father. So again, James's freedom and passage to Scotland had been financed by the slave trade. A very complex story indeed. Now, whether James was aware of this paradox or how he felt about it, if he did, no, remains unsaid. In fact, he could disappear from the archival record eventually once he arrived in Shetland. Uh, the archival material presents James as someone whose life was controlled by other people, buffeted from Jamaica to Shetland at the whims of a group of adults, and any trace of power or agency that James Jr. possessed is quite difficult to find. So returning to Vincent, Brown, Vincent Brown's words uh, that I quoted earlier, it strikes me that the best way to tease out James Ennis Jr.'s story is through this rigorous and responsible creativity. So rather than ask, or as well as asking the kind of basic questions that scholars ask of archival material, the kind of who, what, where, why, when questions, I think we need to ask a, another set of perhaps more empathetic and imaginative questions. Perhaps we should ask questions like, did James Ennis Jr. know who his father was? How would he have felt to know that his enslaved mother um, and enslaved father had, had a child? Did he want to come to Scotland, his supposed home? How did it feel to be taken from his mother and sent to Shetland at two days' notice? What was it like to be a person of colour in Lerwick in the early 1800s? It's difficult to answer these questions definitively, but I would suggest that the story was not necessarily a happy one. And the answer to these questions are necessarily tentative, but for me, they're better than the absolute silence he's been afforded in these sources. And I'm hoping to contribute to a, a forthcoming volume that's uh, kind of in the works to talk about his story um, in the context of marginalised people in early modern Scotland. Um, so I've reached the end of my talk, uh, so I'd like to thank you for listening, and I hope that um, you've enjoyed it, and I'm happy to answer any questions afterwards. Thank you. Thanks so much, Matthew. Thank you for sharing James Innes Jr.'s story with us. Um, I, I feel like that's good that he's He's getting recognized in, in yeah. some way um, and that's a great example of a, a kind of an archive that wasn't recognized as one until we started looking into Scotland's participation in slavery so um, I'm really excited to hear that that's going to have more of a presence on the library's website library with a capital L. Um, next up we have Caroline McCracken Flesher um, who you may know as past convener of IASL. Um, without her hard work, we wouldn't be here today. Uh, she's also a professor of English at the University of Wyoming. Her books include two monographs from Oxford, Possible Scotland's Walter Scott and the Story of Tomorrow, and The Doctor Dissected, A Cultural Autopsy of the Burt and Hare Murders as well as edited volumes on the Scottish Parliament, Scottish science fiction, and teaching Scottish writers. She's editing Stevenson's Kidnapped for the new Edinburgh edition of, of Stevenson's works. And she and uh, Matt Wickman have just published a volume titled Walter Scott at 250, looking forward with Edinburgh University Press to uh, celebrate the 250th anniversary of Scott's birth. Uh, Caroline has been working on the Ab Abbotsford Visitor books for the past few years, along with Kirsty Archer Thompson, who works at Abbotsford, and she's published a number of articles focused on the work the books perform. That's what she's going to tell us about today. Hello, everyone. And I am going to take a moment and share my screen. So just hold on for that. And as it comes up, um, let me say again, our thanks to IASL, to uh, Juliet and Carla, who are advancing IASL in such interesting ways at the moment. Um, and to thank them, I would like to thank them for the opportunity to introduce uh, I think uh, Matthew had a really good word for it, the accidental archive. This is the accidental and unexpected archive. And I'm very much attracted by Carolyn Steedman's idea of you know, the, the, arc, the great flowing river of everything and then the flotsam that kind of washes up on the beach. And that's where we live when we, when we work in the, in the archive. And I think Matthew's point about to discovering the, the, the methods, um, the designs by which we can read an archive and what we can see in it, and particularly see 
the things that might otherwise be invisible to us. That's really very much what has um, uh, enlivened my work in the archive. Um, and of course, you'll, you'll know that uh, I'm mostly a literary scholar and I tend to pursue points of insistence, right? So I'm, this is a little bit about how I got into this particular archive. And so I have, I've written about Scots, many Scotlands, and I've written about the stories that we kind of obsessively tell ourselves around um, the Burke and Hare murders. But my long-term project at the moment, and if I could get um, slides to advance, you would see it. My long-term project at the moment is this, uh, focusing on um, the discourse of homecoming that seems so elaborated in Scotland and has been operationalized um, uh, to uh, other communities and that seems to be, in some respects, oversubscribed by non-Scots. This is a sign that at least used to welcome you if you were fortunate enough to be landing um, at Edinburgh Airport. This is home, sort of a, a phrase broadcast to the world. Now, following ideas of home, of course, for me, was going to take me back to Scott. And um, you know, that's the place where I'd be looking to see uh, um, how Scott wrote Homecoming, right? So the Lady of the Lake, uh, the Lord of the Isles and so on, all have this sort of rush into Scotland at some point. Um, Waverly uh, is full of moments of hospitality where Waverly is fed breakfast after breakfast. I only just started to look at that and it's remarkable how many breakfasts Waverly gets to eat and how he gets incorporated in ideas of homecoming until, you know, ultimately Scott has written his home away from home and he has his feet under the table at Tully Violum. So very much there's a literary discourse on which I can draw, but if I'm working on Scott and Scott's ideas of home, well, if home is the trope, then Abbotsford has to be a topic. And Abbotsford uh, was built in the 18 teens and inscribes Scott's later life, right, in the library, in all the books he collected, in uh, the walls, all the artifacts he collected and uh, uh, has installed literally in the walls, uh, in the artifacts people gave him and that he collected, in uh, the items that did really belong in to belong to him and 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 which he sat right like his chair are sort of central to Abbotsford but focusing on those types of materials after a while it began to seem to me that I was trying to derive Scott's affect from Scott's authorship and artifacts but Abbotsford was also full of visitors who met and responded to or went to seek those kinds of things. And Scott, of course, as we know, was always inviting people to Abbotsford. This is just a selection of people who visited in his lifetime. It was obviously a place where um, authors in particular wanted to be. And those people themselves as writers um, and invested in their own identity with relation to Scott, left their own archives. So every one of these people has an extensive disquisition on what it was like to be welcomed at Abbotsford. Washington Irving is, is one of the earlier ones to have written extensively about it, and um, really interestingly, because he gives us a sense of the private home when the home was building, and what it was like to be there when it was only the family. And also how even then Scott was aware that, that having that house in the borders was sort of recasting the landscape around it. And uh, Irving remarks on how um, if you, when you go to uh, Melrose, the uh, sexton has started to present the cathedral or the, the, the abbey in ways that are, um, uh, that yield to the tourist gaze. Right. So, you know, you're supposed to bend over and look between your legs because you get, get a better view on things or you're supposed to um, or he holds up a lantern to be like the moon shedding light on, on Abbotsford. And Irving also tells you not just about the family, he tells you about all the dogs, the animals and so on. And he talks about how the family works together, how that all works together to be homely. Right. And how, how people welcome one another. So there are plenty of literary sources about what it was like to visit Abbotsford. But then, of course, there's a counter discourse by someone like Thomas Carlyle in 1838, writing his review of Lockhart's memoir of Scott's life, where uh, uh, Carlyle, who did not get to visit, 
focuses in on the tourist and his language I think is, is uh, telling. He says that Abbotsford became infested with tourists, wonder hunters, all that fatal species of people. And he says, solitary Ettrick saw itself populous. All paths were beaten with the feet and hoofs of an endless miscellany of pilgrims. And he doesn't really make much distinction between the people and their mode of transportation. As many of, as 16 parties have arrived at Abbotsford in one day, male and female. And he says, Mr. Lockhart thinks there was no literary sh shrine ever so be pilgrim. And of course he thinks it's a kind of a, a, a accumulation of grime, um, the negative side of patina when you have too many tourists. You, and he wasn't wrong because of course Abbotsford became a tourist destination during Scott's life. So it wasn't just the people Scott invited who showed up. There were tour books that told you how to visit Abbotsford. This one, is in 1830 is in its third edition. I think it starts being published in eight, about 1825. And, and then again, of course, the industry that supports tourism that grew up around it. And Scott himself, while alert to this, also had some mixed feelings because Irving says that he talked about this great influx of English travelers, which had inundated Scotland, and that's his word. And Scott doubted whether they had not injured the old fashioned Scottish character. Formerly, he says, they came here as sportsmen to shoot moor game without any idea of looking at scenery. And they moved about the country in hardy, simple style, coping with the country people in their own way. But now they come rolling about in their equipages to see ruins and spend money. And their lavish extravagance has, extravagance has played the vengeance with the common people. Right? It, and he says it's kind of destroyed the common people. Irving, of course, speaks right back and says, well, I think you had something to do with that. And, and Scott admits it, but is nonetheless concerned. So, and Scott, as I said, you know, is, is alert to the value, to the local economy. I beg your pardon, it's suddenly very noisy outside my door. He's alert to the value to the local economy of um, this, this kind of reality. And certainly, subsequently, Abbotsford has very much been curated since Scott's death and even more so after they built the second wing, his granddaughter built the second wing, um, it's been curated for visitors. And uh, one of the early awarenesses after Scott's death was, was to do that so that in uh, the subscribers in London met in 1832 in November, quickly after Scott's death, to talk about how to maintain um, the books the, the antiquarian objects and so on, and specifically for Scott's family, but also uh, to be visited by strangers, right? So that, so that Abbotsford, as I say, was curated from the start. But then that brought me to this question, and this is the one place where I'd really like to emphasize um, that tourists have been leaving their mark, not invited visitors, tourists have been leaving their mark since 1833 in visitor books at Abbotsford. It is a continuous history of visitor books. And those visitors then are available as data in that location. These books, by the way, are the property of the family that then became property of the trust. So you will not find them up in Edinburgh, you'll find them at Abbotsford. The question for something like this then is how do you approach an archive like this? Because it doesn't yield to our normal ways of, of analysis if we're literary scholars. And one initial, immediate point of engagement is kind of as the reading archive, right? I have sat there and turned over page after page after page to record that, to take photographs of them for subsequent work. And uh, you discover that you're a very pattern re recognizing animal because certain names just pop off the page. And those are often the names featured in uh, Abbotsford at the Visitor Center. And in this case, it's Oscar Wilde, but Dickens, Charlotte Bronte, and so on. So clearly, if we were thinking networks, networks of authors continue to revolve around or to, to uh, around Abbotsford after Scott's death. But then there are entries like this, which are not caught in earlier readings of the visitor books. Sometimes there's a little X in the margin that means Corson has seen this or someone else has seen this and, and used it. Um, but here is at the top line, Mr. Stevenson and party, not marked as Mr. Stevenson in 1867 and it's seven Harriet Row, Edinburgh. And that is indeed uh, Robert Louis Stevenson's family. But it poses a problem for us as an entry because who is and party? 
Robert Louis Stevenson would have been 17. He would have been on his way to college uh, and just in the next month. Um, was he there as a grumpy teenager? Was he getting ready to attend his classes? Who knows? There's a gap in the archive. Similarly, we, we can track lots of uh, American authors. Someone like Paul Westover, Anne Rowland has spent um, have paid attention to how authors are impacted by the idea of Scott's house and build their own houses, but we can also find those people in the visitor books, such as, for instance, here's Herman Melville, but perhaps less expected, you'll also find Sam Clements. And the reason why Sam Clements has no little mark in the margin beside his name, we decided, is because, of course, he signed as Sam Clements, not Mark Twain. And so the eye just didn't catch it in the same way. But here he is, uh, the same year that he's busy buying his big sets of Scott, only to later decide that perhaps uh, he, had, he, he, he finds Scott worthy of critique. So networks of authors. You can, even at this level, see sort of nodes, right? Ways in which particular populations flow through Abbotsford. Ulysses S. Grant on the one hand, and then Farragut, who's the first admiral of the Union Navy, the guy who said, damn the torpedoes full steam ahead. That's him on the, in the bottom one. Um, but there are also, I think, and this, this one's for Matthew, fascinating networks of American abolitionists and uh, uh, formerly enslaved people, and also, of course, of those who uh, were not opposed to abolition. So Harriet Beecher Stowe comes in the 1850s, but then here's William Wells Brown, uh, who um, uh, traveled to uh, the United Kingdom, and then uh, the Fugitive Slave Act came into operation in America, and he could not go back, and he comes to Abbotsford and talks about the value of national authorship and how this house might be shared with the nation. So very, very interesting clusters of people. But at the same time, there are still, still and yet, layers that we really can't get at. Um, here's, here's an example. This is Thomas Cook, uh, founder of Cook's Tours, right, eventually. And you can see his name uh, bottom right there. He's at the top of the page, Thomas Cook. And he says, London with party of 143, 143 American, um, and I can't quite read what's the, what's the next piece, tourists, I think. But then you, then you continue down the page, here they all are. So one known person and a lot who are harder to track. This actually is the, is the hook that I had to try to begin to unpack that set of data. Uh, here is another tour guide of whom you may not be aware, but evidently Professor Libby really wanted you to know that he had been at Abbotsford with his tour because one year he puts in um, the, uh, the little sketch of his luggage label. The next year, somewhat gauchely, he just pastes it in the book. There's nothing else that I found quite like that. So pasted label, it's a business, makes him trackable. And indeed, Google is a wonderful thing. Once I started to track Professor Libby, I found him quite quickly. Uh, he it was a figure in Spartansburg where the newspaper says he is considered the famed European tourist. And he happened to be on the dock at Chicago when there was a major navigation disaster, a works outing on board ship, turned turtle right at the, um, on the dock. And Professor Libby was there and assisted um, trying to revive, resuscitate people. So you can sometimes find a name that has enough of a history in 19th century publication. You can track it even when it's not a major name. H.W. Hoyt stood out to me because right now I'm talking to you from Hoyt Hall in Laramie, Wyoming. But H.W. Hoyt turns out, again, he's Googleable because he has enough money to be traveling to Europe and to Abbotsford. And Hoyt turns out to have owned a lumber yard in Chicago uh, in the 1860s, he is um, uh, hiring black workers. And the local Irish workers get annoyed and start to riot. And there are riots around Chicago. Um, numerous people go, go to jail, but, but Mr. Hoyt believed in hiring black workers and did, um, and did so successfully. But then you start to dig a little deeper and you discover, for instance, that he hosted um, 
important dinners on the left, or that he was on the board of the Great Lakes Engineering Works, or that what looks like his son died in uh, um, Venezuela, right, the next generation on. And so there are levels and levels of data that, courtesy of the glories of Google, you can pursue. So, but that then leads to the, here, this phenomenon. Potentially, there are important stories behind all these names, right? It gets to the point that Matthew made about how do you pursue the next generation um, of, of Innesses, for instance. And in this case, there are some really wonderful clues. So here, the Sterling Master Builders Association all came at once um, and marked themselves as such. Can we dig deeper on that? That would presumably be a next stage, right? To try to figure out some of these people. Uh, so the project for us going forward at the moment is having you know, looked at the things that stand out, because those are this kind of low hanging fruit. The much harder thing is to try to record all those other names and perhaps make them searchable as a database and pursuable perhaps in other venues like Google, particularly if somebody's giving you a full street address. Um, and so for the first hundred years of visitor books, uh, I blithely thought I was going to enter these one by one. And this is the record from the first day when I sat, stood in Abbotsford and was busily typing one book and decided quite quickly that this is not going to work. So our project currently in, has involved uh, two um, UW undergraduate work studies to try to uh, start transcription. And this is their work here, which is, as you can see, a little bit more sophisticated than the previous attempt. And um, what we discovered was, of course, the difficulty for many students of 19th century handwriting. And so now we are including uh, um, uh, our graduate students in history who have an interest in and a facility in 19th century handwriting. And they are pursuing, the, again, transcribing as much as we can. And this is a long-term project, by the way. So if you'd like to be interested, we can probably involve you. And so this brings me to my final point. Um, these the books can be searchable for all kinds of things. Uh, Alistair Dury has looked at them from a tourism perspective. Ke uh, um, uh, Kevin James and Guelph, similarly. But you can imagine all kinds of ways in which you could pursue networks. Um, and so on, but we need people to sign the books to have the data. And so I think as academics, we find visitor books slightly embarrassing. We don't know whether we should leave our mark uh, when we visit um, uh, uh, Sunnyside in New York or when, when we visit Abbotsford. I would encourage you though, please, uh, to sign. Don't be like the person who signed themselves as Colonel Flapdoodle from Bootle, Japan. Um, think about leaving your record. Think about inserting your name here. And who knows, you know, 30 years later, you might go back and discover that you have visited right after graduation. And there you are in the book. So my thanks to the University of Wyoming, the Abbotsford Trust, Kirsty Archer Thompson in particular, who has been a huge help, and to the students uh, who have participated. Um, uh, and uh, as I say, next time you're uh, somewhere like this, please sign on the dotted line. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caroline. That was fascinating. Uh, I, I can imagine you'll be able to do some great data visualization with that, uh, showing how many people visited per year and the breakdown of where they came from and everything. Um, it's a great topic. Uh, our final speaker is Charlotte Lauder, who is a PhD student at Strathclyde University, where she's working on 19th century Scottish magazines. She has an essay on women journalists and the people's friends forthcoming in Victorian periodicals review, based on her uh, thesis research. Charlotte sits on the advisory board of the AHRC funded Scottish magazines network and she's organizing an online seminar, Unforgettable, Unforgotten, continuing the recovery of Scottish women writers from 1880 to 1940. This seminar is hosted by the Scottish Network for Religion and Literature at New College, Edinburgh University. The deadline for proposals, if you'd like to submit one, is May 7th, and the seminar itself will take place on June 29th. And I will um, post the link to the, the call for uh, papers in the chat in case you'd like to, 
Right. Thanks very much, Charlotte. Thanks, Juliet. Um, can you hear me OK? Yeah. OK, great. Thank you. Um, right. I'm just going to bash on and bring up the rear of these um, wonderful presentations so far. Um, so I'm going to be talking about using um, archives to recover um, the people behind the press in Scottish magazines that were produced um, between 1870 and 1920. And I've now just realised I should share my PowerPoint. That would be helpful for you. OK, there's the title. Um, so the magazines that I look at are um, considerably overlooked in the study of Scottish literature. And I argue in my thesis that um, this lack of research into magazines is concurrent with the relatively brief examination of um, popular Scottish literature of the same period. And what my research is proving to me, <laughs> that's my doorbell, is that um, popular Scottish literature between 1870 and 1920 is concentrated in these magazines. And what the average Scot um, read and considered as literature um, beyond the more well-known works of um, Stevenson and J.M. Barry and George MacDonald and many others um, was published in and made um, popular by these publications. Um, and I have written about this um, in the Scottish Magazines Network blog, if you want to have a look there. So the main case study in my PhD is The People's Friend, which was established in Dundee in 1869 as a working class um, literary miscellany, and it is still published um, in Dundee to this day. And on the left of the screen, you can see its first issue, which came out in um, January 1869, and on the right is its anniversary issue from January 2019. Um, and when I started my PhD, very little was known about the history of the People's Friend. And what I soon became interested in was recovering the people who um, owned the magazine, who wrote for the magazine, um, as a way of understanding what uh, the publication's intentions were, um, what it published, um, why, and, and thus the kind of overall impact of the magazine. And I've used this method to recover, recover other Scottish magazines, um, which are far less well known than The People's Friend. And it's become a really useful exercise overall in assessing um, magazine culture. So um, the study of, ma of modern Scottish magazines um, lies at the intersection of the three main archive types, um, which was proposed um, as, the, as the kind of examination for this panel. Um, obviously, magazines are the primary resource, um, as well as newspapers from the time, which provide a huge amount of information, um, and also special issues like holiday numbers or um, Christmas editions. Um, and when consider considering the people behind the press, um, magazines like The People's Friend were really fastidious in publishing the obituaries of its journalists and its editors and its more sort of regular contributors. And so I have found a lot of information about these people just by reading the magazines. Um, but overall, this is a really time consuming process, um, especially when you don't know anything about these people or even their dates of life. So especially during the pandemic, um, digital archives have become a very solid rock on which to stand and the British newspaper archive is probably the most um, important um, source for me as is um, the ProQuest British periodicals although there are quite um, there are very few Scottish magazines um, digitized there um, I've also been relying on sources that um, specifically recover, I suppose, um, the history of people. And, and one of these is Scotland's People, which is the digitized statutory records of Scotland and also UK Census Online. Although um, both of them are not without issues in terms of OCR and both are behind paywalls. Finally, um, there are some items in manuscript archives and special collections, um, as we've seen lots discussed about today, um, that relate to Scottish magazines. And these are principally letters and correspondence, as well as um, some ledgers and some business records. These are always quite patchy. Um, and often they're sort of personal papers from contributors or staff 
there are um, a whole host of people to recover um, who are so-called behind the press. Um, and for me, research into women journalists has been really fruitful. Um, and I've given um, quite a few public talks about Jessie M. King, who's a prominent Dundee journalist um, on the screen. And I've also written a little bit about how we use digital archives or how digital archives can be used um, to recover um, women writers who used pseudonyms. Um, and that was, <laughs> that was published by the Women's History blog. Uh, the Women's History Scotland blog, sorry, if you want to um, have a read of that. But today I want to focus on a journalist that I haven't talked about before, um, just as a way to kind of demonstrate how a combination of all of those archive types that I mentioned um, can be used to recover a female journalist. So um, I first came across uh, Jean Kidd in Andrew Scott's book, Dundee's Literary Lives, which describes her um, as a poet who wrote under the pseudonym of Deborah. And this information was itself taken from um, D.H. Edwards's colossal um, 16 volume <laughs> series called Modern Scottish Poets. And um, in it, there is an entry for Jean in the 1888 volume, um, which uh, I've sort of taken a screenshot of um, just here. So there are several basic facts in this um, biography. Jean was aged 18, uh, sorry, aged 19 in 1877. Um, so her birth year is roughly sort of 1857 or 1858. Um, it says she was born in Dundee. Um, by the age of 21, she was a widow. Um, she then remarried. She moved with that man to London. She was widowed again. Um, and she is most closely associated as a poet who published in the Dundee Evening Telegraph. So um, I kind of wanted to see if I could confirm some of these facts. So I searched for Deborah in the Evening Telegraph, which has been um, wonderfully digitized by the British Newspaper Archive. And um, I found several poems by her and poems dedicated to her between 1886 and 1894. And these are just some on the screen. I was also able to find that Jean published a volume of poetry in 1889 that was um, entitled Poems from the Hearth. Um, to then try and sort of um, tidy up some of the biographical details, I used Scotland's People. And on the screen is a search from the 1891 census, which basically used the, the details that I had, um, that her name was Jean Kidd. She would have been sort of between 30 and 40 years old by 1891, and that she was a resident in Dundee. Um, and this was successful. I found one Jean Kidd who was living in Dundee in the 1891 census um, with her widowed mother, Mary, and her sisters and her age matches the birth year from the original source and um, she's listed as a widow and her occupation is a journalist so from this it appears that Jean's maiden name was Christy um, and we might guess that her second marriage is the one where she becomes Mrs Kidd. So what of Jean Kidd the, um, the widowed journalist? Um, in a wider search of Dundee newspapers in the British Newspaper Archive, I found that Deborah was a name that appeared quite frequently um, against the ladies column um, in the Evening Telegraph. And here you can see um, the name Deborah alongside some reports um, from the time. And then another search um, <laughs> also threw up um, really interesting Halloween fiction and ghost stories um, that also had the name Deborah associated with it. And these were either published in the Evening Telegraph or the Evening Telegraph and Post, which is what that newspaper um, transitioned into. Then after sort of several hours, basically, of combing through digitized newspapers, I eventually managed to find this report, which details a presentation that was made to Jean um, that consisted of a silver tea set and a case of fruit knives, um, which came from the staffs of the People's Friend, the People's Journal, the Dundee Advertiser and the Evening Telegraph. And this was given to her on the occasion of her marriage to Reverend Archibald Allen. 
And this report is really good because it confirms that Jean was a proper, well-respected member of the journalistic staff in Dundee. Um, and she was highly respected by her colleagues because um, in a wider sort of search of, of Scottish journalism that I'm doing on the side, um, these kinds of presentations where gifts were exchanged and speeches were made only really took place for um, treasured members of staff. So um, Jean did indeed marry um, Reverend Allen in September 1897. And as you can see by this um, entry in the marriage um, column, which often appears in um, Victorian newspapers, um, her name, her pseudonym Deborah is there. So she was clearly well known, um, not just to the, the journalists that she worked with, but also to the readers of her paper. And from here, Jean is now effectively um, Mrs. Reverend um, Archibald Allen. So um, kind of trying to trace her husband in a, in a search on the internet for Reverend Allen, who was Minister of Channel Kirk, which is just outside Lauder in the Scottish borders. Um, I found a letter that is held in the University of Dundee archives, which Allen wrote to a friend, Mr. Naismith, um, alongside a signed copy of Deborah's poetry. And this is significant because it confirms that Jean was well known by her pseudonym and also um, her husband was quite clearly proud of that fact. Um, and this is quite an interesting development because it kind of confirms something that most of us would, would acknowledge that, that it's very difficult to trace um, married women, particularly in the late 19th, early 20th centuries, because they were primarily known by their husband's name. Um, and it can be difficult to trace them in the archives themselves, even in sort of paper catalogues um, within um, archive buildings, um, because we don't always know what their married name was, what their maiden name was, when they got married. Um, and in the press, this is common. Um, and it's very easy to find information about the husbands and not always about the wives. Um, and this is the case for Jean. So it is through... Um, the obituary for her husband, for Reverend Allen, that we find out more information about Jean in her later life. So um, we finally get a description of her. Um, she is described as having considerable intellectual ability. She's well known under the name, the sorry, the pseudonym Aunt Kate, who um, as a compiler of several popular and accessible books for the housewife. And this fact um, that Jean was known as Aunt Kate is incredibly significant and something I never um, thought I would um, find. So Aunt Kate um, was a pseudonym that first appeared in the People's Journal in 1880 and was subsequently associated with the People's Friend magazine as well. And Aunt Kate was a domestic columnist, um, an agony aunt and a household editor for these, um, these publications who also um, published her own books like the ones on the screen um, as well as pamphlets. And these lasted well into the, 60, the 1960s and 70s. And pseudonymous household editors um, like Aunt Kate were a staple feature of Scottish magazines um, and were a way of targeting women as readers and consumers of the press. And the household editor itself um, became a respected role for women journalists from the 1880s. So finally, with all this information and the extraneous details, um, I was able to find um, Jean's obituary. So she died in 1929, aged 72, and her obituary confirms all of the details that I had been finding, that she was born in Dundee, um, she was a member of the Christie family, she married three times, um, she wrote poetry in the Evening Telegraph, and she also conducted the Children's Corner of the People's Journal, which I didn't know about until I found this obituary. Um, and finally, she was described as ever ready to help and encourage by practical means, as well as by advice, which certainly I think is a reference to the alter ego of Aunt Kate. So what's the point, um, I hear you say, of all of this um, research? Well, firstly, I'm able to recover Jean's life um, just beyond her poetry, which I appreciate in itself is interesting. Um, but an analysis of her career um, in terms of Scottish journalism has 
sort of confirmed my conclusions that um, women, journal uh, women um, journalists from the 1880s and 18 1890s were opportunistic, uh, their work was multifaceted, and magazines were a really crucial entry point for women into this kind of journalism. I'm also able to find out more information about Aunt Kate, as I mentioned, um, and I'm able to posit that Jean was most likely the author of these penny handbooks, which are held in the Dundee Central Library and which are currently unattributed, but because they date roughly to the 1890s, it's very, very likely um, that Jean had some hand in editing these, bringing the collection together and probably um, promoting them. Now, of course, PhD students should always remember that um, catalogers for national libraries are far um, more um, are far smarter than themselves. And I could have actually saved myself hours of research by just simply searching for Jean's um, poetry volume, which the National Library has a copy of, and which the catalogers um, have already um, attributed her married name and her dates of life to um, that volume. Um, further, there is another um, library connection um, with the deposited collection of Jean's daughter, um, who was called Jean Mary Allen, um, and she was a librarian and novelist in Edinburgh, and her papers contain some of Deborah's manuscripts, um, her poetry that was cut out of newspapers. Um, there are also some pages of an unpublished autobiography, which dates to 1964, um, and this may shed more light on Jean as a woman, but it's probably her daughter's autobiography. So ultimately, um, as I hope I've demonstrated to you, it is through a combination of all of these different archive types, um, print, manuscript and digital, um, and through the use of different research techniques, that we can enrich the recovery of um, overlooked or forgotten figures from the Scottish press. And ultimately, this helps us with um, our insights into journalism, magazine culture in Scotland, as well as Scottish literature more broadly. Uh, so thank you. Thank you so much, Charlotte. That was wonderful. I'm so impressed by your uh, reconstructive work. Uh, I, I mean, in, it seems like when you get to the end of the 19th century, in a way, the problem is there's so much material that you have to, to sort through. It can be like uh, looking for a needle in a haystack, but you seem to have found needles over and over again. Um, we do have time for questions. Uh, if anyone wants to post into the chat or you can uh, unmute yourself and, and ask um, directly, whatever you prefer. Can I, can I start out? Let's, wow, fantastic uh, papers. Thank you so much, um, everyone, for your, your um, contributions here. Um, I think this is a, a, a large question, but it's it's something that I think about quite a lot. Um, I'm noticing with all the papers, we're pushing back against um, what's considered the literary. Um, Matthew, you were saying letters as literature. Caroline, you're looking at these at these guest books, and um, Charlotte also to look at uh, anonymous periodical material. Um, and I guess I'm just I'm. I'm thinking about that more and what it means to be doing archival work as to to change our assumptions about the literary and I think also how we do that work as well. So I'm wondering if people want to talk about that and I guess a corollary question also something that connects to what Juliet said previously. Um, how do we do this work in uh, an equitable way when some people have access to archives and others don't how do we make sure that a new iteration of thinking about literature is not just um, siphoning off just a few people doing this work but making it more available to um to everybody so two kind of connected questions big questions but i'm curious what people think well I'll, I'll pick it up in hopes that others will have things to say that will be um, the really on. Uh, you know, I think you and I started in, in the field whenever it was very discipline specific, I think. And um, we've been lucky enough uh, 
to always be able to have questions that sort of flow beyond, right? When you were thinking of union or I was trying to think about possible Scotlands or whatever, we automatically found ourselves in different kinds of archives, right? And, and, and valuing those kinds of archives and all the kinds of art access that Charlotte was talking about that are available through you know, our colleagues who are, are um, archivists and so on. But I, but I think, um, my work has, has always been very alert and hoping to be alert to contexts. And I think that those contexts become more and more available to us, right? So, so part of it is an access question. Whenever I was saying, you know, I, I found Mr. Hoyt and then I Googled him, right? I'm not joking. That's exactly what I did. Uh, and, and what I was able to find about him the first time around was less than, you know, maybe a year later, you go back right now and all of a sudden you're able to find much more. Um, and of course, I was alert to what uh, Charlotte was saying about the census, right? Because I haven't tried to cross check on censuses. But um, I think for the, for the project that I'm currently in, and I'm imagining Matthews is, is very similar, a lot of it is about uh, trying to, on the one hand, engage with the materials in an interesting way and bring them alive right now and show their possibilities, but also to make them ultimately available to many other scholars who will do vastly different things with them. And for us, the challenge is, is that there is so much um, and limited time. And, you know, what I, if I had time, I, what, I, what we really need is a grant, right, that would allow a whole number of us who might be interested to just get these transcribed and then make them available um, for various types of search and so on, and including public search. And that's a piece I want to stress because Abbotsford, of course, has, has tourists coming through it all the time. It has people who, um, you know, are interested in tracking you know, where their, where their families might have shown up in any kind of record. And if indeed we were able to record people's names, addresses, dates, where that's possible. And, and by the way, more recent tour books, which we're, which we're not looking at, but people start to leave comments as well. Um, but, but that kind of material allows, you know, yields to searches in so many different ways. You could actually go in and do, do what I did, which was I knew I had been to Abbotsford before, so I went to that year and tried to find myself, and there I was. But but you could do it independently of that, right? You could search for your relatives. You could search for you know a particular field of interest or whatever. Um, and and um, as as I see people are asking me questions already in, in the margin about who you can find and how. But but I think our next step, if we can manage it, is to is to complete that work such that it is available to everybody else. Um, I'll just have a, have a go as well, if that's okay. Um, so, I mean, I am in an English department, but I'm a historian by background, so I'm undergraduate degree and my, my uh, M lit were, were in history, but I've kind of a cuckoo in the, the literary nest, as it were. Um, so I, I suppose I had very sort of specific training about how to deal with sources, and that was just to kind of scrape them for raw material. Um, you know, raw facts and, and try and build chronology out of them. And I think that it took, it kind of took me a while, but once I started to kind of look at the kind of textual, if you like, aspects of archival sources or, or any source for that matter, being able to kind of pick them apart, uh, read between the lines, maybe in a way that's more kind of literary, if you like, I think I was able to kind of find or imagine the possibilities about the lives of enslaved people and so on. Um, and I think that kind of um, way of approaching a source can be really useful. Uh, and so kind of uh, to touch on what Leith was talking about, kind of expanding what literature means uh, can be really kind of helpful. And I think so that shows that kind of interdisciplinary research can be more than just a, a buzzword that people used to get money out of, out of other people. Um, and that kind of uh, taking those approaches can be kind of mutually reinforcing as well. I, I can very quickly speak about that last part, I think, um, Leith, of that question about equitable research. Um, and I think what you mean by that is sort of access and and being fair in, in who gets access to, to archives. Um, and what has been quite a frustrating part of, of, of combining digital with print and manuscript archives is the fact that most um, interesting digital archives or digitized records are behind paywalls. So um, Scotland's people 
is a bit of a racket in terms of how much you have to pay to access what you need. Um, the British Newspaper Archive, again, is behind a paywall, as is the UK Census Online. So what's frustrating is that these um, sources have the information that researchers can train themselves to get and can learn about research by using. I mean, my skills in using Scotland's people, for example, has really, really improved, but that's only because I've had research money available to me to then, you know, plow into that uh, website and then further the skill there. Um, and finally, I think um, what I find quite interesting about using these sources is kind of what Caroline was saying about the sort of the extraneous information that comes alongside these entries. So I liked that what you were saying about what street they lived on or who they brought with them. Um, and I'll be honest, when I find somebody that hasn't been written about before, who's been dismissed from the canon or from or from scholarship more generally, I'm quite determined to find out everything I can about them, where they lived and where they might have been and who their children were. Because what I all feel is often kind of forgotten when we talk about archives is how much information do we put in if we're recovering somebody, for example, or if we're recovering a manuscript that hasn't been looked at, you know, what what do we include when we're doing that recovery or we're writing up about that recovery? Is it useful to know, for example, and this is pertaining to my sort of interest in women's history, is it useful to know that she was married three times in the case of Jean or is it useful to know that um, she, she was, you know, in an asylum for a few years? Is that useful to us in the case of the person I was talking about? She wasn't. But in another scenario, that might be a question there. So I think generally sort of equity and access always kind of goes along with what we include and what we omit essentially from the same kind of the same kind of discussion. Thank you all. Uh, we're sorry. sorry, were you going to say something, Caroline? I would just add, and, and maybe this is for Leith, that, that, that all of the work that we're talking about is public humanities work. Right, um, and and so I'm very thinking very much about you know who in particular is interested. Even you know you're saying on the one hand that this manuscript has not been much addressed, but on the other hand, it has a huge public interest, um, and 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 so you know accessibility and and uh, has to bear that in mind, right? How how we communicate what we discover, um, and and to whom it's meaningful. Yeah, uh, Catherine Lavender has made a great point in the chat there that um, we need to advocate directly for scholarly access models at lower or no costs. So I, I think this um, discussion today really illustrates the value of that because you're all doing such fascinating work um, and the sources you're using as well as the, the knowledge that you're gaining should be um, available to as many people as, as possible. Uh, we are technically out of time now, so I don't want to keep you all. Uh, if anyone has any quick last minute questions, um, feel free to go ahead and post them. But um, otherwise, I think we should thank our wonderful speakers uh, one last time. And uh, keep in mind that, that this... Um, uh, event will be available should you want to watch it again <laughs> because it was just so wonderful uh, and please stay tuned for news about future events from um, IASL in this this dialogue series many thanks to you all <laughs>